Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. I know it's February, but we haven't had one of these Explore series in a while. So welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We're really excited that you could join us for our first NCAR Explorer series of 2021, um, which is with NCAR Associate Scientist Agbelia Miko called The Internet of Things for 3D Printed Weather Technologies and Forecasting. My name is Dr. Lorena Medina Luna. <laughs> And I'm an education designer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a leading organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system, and the sun. And throughout the event, you'll be able to ask questions using our interface of Slido. If you're not familiar with it, you can join and answer some poll questions, as well as ask your questions to our scientists as we have our conversation today um, for the next hour. This conversation is going to be recorded and will be available on our NCAR Explorer series website, where you can also find other lectures, conversations, and events that we've hosted for um, the past five years since this is our fifth year. Yay! Um, now I'd like to introduce our guest for today, NCAR Associate Scientist, Agbeli Amico. Hey, Agbeli. Hi, Lorena. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And um, just so that you know a little bit about Agbelli, he has over um, 20 years of experience in commercial weather forecasting, international business development, renewable energy sensors, and data science. He works in the Computation Information Systems Laboratory, or CISL, where he works on creating a user-friendly 3D printed weather station platform with Raspberry Pi embedded weather forecasting for use in education, outreach and field programs. He received his degrees in business and geophysics from the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'd like us all to do a virtual welcome to Agbelli. Welcome Agbelli. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And we're so excited to learn more about the internet of things. And just to get us started, I think, um, can you tell us a little bit about what is the internet of things? Okay. I'm going to share my presentation here. Can everyone see? So, it looks good on our end, yeah. Excellent. So the Internet of Things is something that we see every day, and we're seeing more and more of Internet of Things. Um, if you look at this example of a smart home, you'll see that there are sensors within embedded into uh, everyday devices from your cookers, to your you know, Apple TV, to your lights, your garage door opener, et cetera. Those things are controlled by sensors and they're also controlled with a computer connected to a sensor. And these things, when you combine them is what they call internet of things. They're things that are connected and embedded into devices and they can be controlled over the internet. They can be controlled autonomously. Um, and there's many uses you can also see more recently that you'll have things like Google Glass or, or Apple Glasses that are coming. You have watches, you have your uh, exercise monitors. All of these things are internet of things with tiny little sensors about this small, if you can see that, these tiny little sensors that are inside of these devices and they are becoming more and more a part of our everyday lives. And that's awesome. And I do have my handy dandy smartwatch as well. So I have an internet of things on my own wrist. And we did have a poll before we get into 3D printed weather stations. Um, and I'm gonna ask if Dan, if you'd be able to share the results from our word cloud, which is what would you want to measure with your own 3D printed weather station? And we have responses that say wind speed, which is the biggest one, how much rain is falling and how fast all weather elements that I can. One minute rainfall, air temperature and wind speed at my cabin. So yeah, it could definitely be at your own space. And definitely welcome to add, keep adding to this word cloud as we go through the day today. Um, and Agbeli, with that, can we go into talking about what are 3D printed weather stations and why are they important? So 3D, 3D printed weather stations, as you can see, they are, they're really important because 
normal weather stations, i.e. professional weather stations, can be very, very expensive. And, and what do we you are, have, do you have a picture by chance that you could share with us if you share your screen? Uh, yes, let me, let me share my screen. Is it not sharing now? So oh, um, we, we shared the survey, so then it kind of, um, you would have to reshare. Okay, let me reshare. Give me one second and I will reshare. Share screen, PowerPoint, sound. I feel like the suspense is so yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder yeah. if anybody has already seen any of these weather stations out and about. So that would be interesting if um, there are any in your neighborhood, maybe after watching this presentation, you might be able to see any out there in the public, um, of course, socially distanced. Um, okay, let me try that again. Let's share screen, I said our zoom world that we live in today let's <laughs> let's share that again yeah and it's great because people are putting in their word cloud they have the vocs volatile organic compounds rain soil moisture in my garden so i'm just kind of reading off i know we're not going to share again this um uh the poll but how much rain is falling and how fast so there's a lot that weather stations can definitely um Give me one second. This thing is having a little bit of trouble. Yeah, uh, no worries. Share this screen real quick. I love seeing the responses in the meantime. I'll do that. We should be able to share that screen there. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And then now. if you can put presenter mode or slash mode, awesome. Yeah. We can see them now. Okay. So this these are examples of 3D printed uh, weather stations. And 3D printed weather stations, the goal of the weather stations are to make it as low cost as possible. So when you have all the components, that is, you can measure temperature, which is what you see here with the, with the radiation shield. This piece right here is measures temperature, pressure, relative humidity. Um, we, also have a, we also have a UV sensor for measuring sunlight. We have a, we have a rain bucket, and I'll show you these things better. It measures rainfall. And then lastly, we have, we have a, a wind uh, sensor on here. So you'll see that there's three different uh, parts to the sensor. And then in the green box on the bottom here, you have you know, just a battery and a little Wi-Fi dongle, to uh, 4G dongle to connect, it to, the, um, to connect it to the world. Here again, you'll see we have a solar panel that's powered by solar, so it doesn't have to be connected or plugged in. It could be autonomous all on its own. And the reason why you would want a 3D printed weather station is because there are other options, of course. One option are the professional weather station that say the National Weather Service and some of the other national governments use. Those weather stations, of course, are set up to, um, to be the you know, record. And those cost somewhere on the order of $20,000 for those weather stations. They're super, super expensive. Of course, they need to be highly durable. They're highly professional stations. Or you could also go to uh, Walmart or on Amazon for a lot cheaper and purchase a weather station. And if you do that, a lot of times you don't have control over what, what you might want to do. You basically, you buy what you buy is what you get. And in this case, you can design and customize this weather station in any way you would like. So you can see here, we've got all three uh, things there. You see on, this, on the picture over here, one of the pieces are not there, but they're going to add that on later. So you can add it in different, in different stages. I'll show one more slide of the, of the weather station. And this was the weather station in the field. Um, and this was, we did a, uh, a Mono at the space uh, sort of like, Observatory in Mauna Loa in Hawaii, where we set up a weather station there. And then you can see here's another sort of like temperature sensor just, just outside of a window in an apartment. So that just shows you the different types of, of, of environments that, that, you can, uh, that you can set these stations up in. That's so great. It's very modular. So if you wanted to print out a weather station, that means you don't have to print everything out all at once. Which leads me to the question, how long does it take to print out a weather station? 
That's a, a very good question. So if you just have one printer, um, it will take you about two days to print out uh, a weather station because each one of these uh, pieces are pieced together. So if you take this thing apart, each one of these pieces take up real estate on a 3D on a 3D printer. So a 3D printer basically has a flat uh, metal heated panel that has the ink or the plastic that comes through and basically etches each part individually. So it takes time for each individual part. And sometimes you can put multiple parts on one uh, on, uh, in one run, but it takes in order to do it all together on one printer, it will take, uh, it'll take two days. Luckily, we actually now, uh, we outsource it to these 3D print shops where you can say, hey, here are all the STL file or the, the, the 3D print files and they'll run it for you. They've got a whole bank of like eight, 10 printers. They'll run it for you and send it back to you in a day. Yeah, so it's great because then you can know that, you know, winter is coming and you want to check the snow levels so you can set up a time ahead of time to, to print these components um, rather than it's going to snow tomorrow. I want it printed and I only have one printer at home. So it's definitely good to have like a, a time frame of what what it takes to to build one of these. Exactly. And I see that there's a lot of people in the picture on the left. So that brings me to the question. Um, how big is the group that are working on these 3D printed weather stations at, at UCAR? That's a very good question and thank you. So there, we have a, a team and we uh, here at, at NCAR at CISL, the Computational Information Systems Lab, this, this, uh, our team is led by Dr. A.J. Lauer, who work also with uh, Virginia, Christy and Mary. They're all hopefully watching, nice to see you all. Uh, and Lily has been also working on the project. So we have a team here internally. Of course, uh, Dr. Keith Mall at the NCAR Library, he's also been uh, playing a key role in the development of this project. Uh, this project also came from the original, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, Comet team with uh, Paul and Martin in another group at UCAR or NCAR as well. And they've been also uh, developing a really professional grade uh, weather station. So we also mentioned that we have community collaboration and what community collaboration means is that our system is an open source system. Anyone can contribute to the weather station and we've been working and are soon to be working with a, a number of different schools and universities. For example, we have students at the University of Puerto Rico who were previously students of ours um, at one of the things we do at INCAR um, in, in this in our group is we run a CyParks, which is a summer internship program in parallel computing. And that in that program, we had uh, a student, Stephen Rivera, Rivera, sorry, and um, Anjali, who was an, another and a source, another uh, intern at another program at INCAR last summer. They came together and they've been working on deploying stations in Puerto Rico. So they have a whole team there. Of course, Virginia Tech, we had uh, one of the original, Dan Fuca, he was one of the people who we worked with at a conference to, to do things, to, to deploy the stations that you saw in Hawaii, uh, you know, Texas, we have 3D printers. Um, we also worked with ESIP Labs, which is another group that gave us a sm small grant to, to develop some, some things. Uh, Next, uh, of course, there's uh, we're also looking to work with schools uh, after and very soon we'll be sending it uh, station parts to test out with the Albuquerque Academy, my alma mater, so go Chargers, and we'll hopefully get some feedback from teachers and students that can all contribute to the advancement of the project. That's so great. And it's so great to see that you have such a wide network of collaborators, because I think that's one of the things with science is it's not just a one person team, it's a multi person team with multi career levels or career stages um, and different skill sets. And um, you mentioned University of Puerto Rico it, um, had some weather stations sent out there. Can you show us, um, I think you have a time lapse of what it would look like to actually build one of these. Yes, uh, uh, let me show you that next. Um, and we'll show this is Angeli and the team of students there. They're about to set up 10 stations. I'll, I'll turn this down just a little bit.
that was awesome. And is this towards research that the students are doing or what was the goal of sending these out? So the, the students are doing uh, research. So some of the students, uh, especially particularly uh, Angelie, she's researching a weather forecast model and she's looking at very small scale effects on the island that you'll see different climate zones within the island and the island is not fully instrumented. It's been hit by hurricanes. There's been maintenance issues with some of the other stations. So what they're looking at doing is increasing the density of weather stations on the island and understanding how using those observational data can help improve forecast models, the mathematical models that they use to run the weather forecasts. That's awesome. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is 3D pause, because I've heard of that before and it has 3D printed weather stations as well. Yes, and oops, oops excuse me, let me move on to the next slide. So the uh, 3D pause is here's uh, uh, both Martin and, um, and Paul here in uh, Kenya and they basically, they've created a, the original version of the weather station that's deployed all over the world. Uh, and they've been working with uh, these Raspberry Pis, and I'll show you this up close in a little bit. And Raspberry Pi is a small microcontroller or computer that allows you to, uh, to collect data from off sensors and, and run it. So basically what you'll see here is it's a similar station to, to ours, and it has all of the stations, all of the parts, you know, the, the rain, the wind, uh, the radiation shield, or the temperature rather, all connected to one Raspberry, Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi does everything and completely runs an entire weather station, stores the data on the Raspberry Pi, sends the Raspberry Pi out. And if you're not familiar with the Raspberry Pi, they cost about $35. Um, I think um, you can you can purchase them on Amazon, and you can actually hook up a uh, a screen and a monitor a monitor to it, like like we do here, and use it just like a normal computer. Um, and that's one thing that you can do with a uh, with a Raspberry Pi that is so so um, that's so so fun to play with. And I'll show another um, uh, slide here that kind of just shows what we're doing with the um, with the project is that we're looking at some of the ideas of 3D Pause, this company called Seed Studio, which makes these really cool little sensors. Um, and we're taking, we're borrowing from those concepts, we're building on those ideas to create a sort of a community styled uh, 3D project that we can work with schools and uh, citizen scientists to, and, and universities like the University of Puerto Rico and others to build a, 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 a sort of IoT weather station. And that was one of the questions. We don't have to show the question real quick, but um, okay. the question was, what are the chances of encouraging participation in NOAA's Citizen Weather Observer Program? Is that related to this? It's, it's, it's not related directly to this, it's not. Uh, this is sort of a new program that we've been uh, starting and actually I'll stop sharing. This is a new program that we've been, uh, that we've just uh, recently started here um, um, at NCAR based off of uh, the 3D pause program. We've also been developing this uh, IoT WX, but the, any involvement with these types of projects is, is, is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's so great to be able to have um, people from all over the communities provide some scientific data to, to help support the research that scientists are doing. So definitely, whether it's the NOAA Citizen Weather Observer Program or others, um, definitely get involved. And um, we'll show some, some websites um, on this presentation, as well as on the Slido on the side. You can click on how to create your own weather station and Raspberry Pi um, interface with WARF. And um, you mentioned that you had the Raspberry Pi in hand. Can you show that to us? Yeah, I'd like to show an example. This is a, I don't know if you can see that this is a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pis are just like uh, computers here. You can see it has USB connections here. It's got a little ethernet connection. Um, and on here, it actually has a little small little computer chip. And these things are what's called a general purpose input output. So you connect sensors to these different pins and it reads what the sensor is doing. And then it stores that information on a say a USB drive and you can you know, access that data. 
the sensors that we're using in the IoT WX or the microcontroller is actually called an atom light. And this is a, a, a pretty small uh, microcontroller here. And you can see it's, it's pretty much, it'd be small, like small about the same size of your watch. And it has also pin in, you can also pin it in as well. But one difference and an important difference here is that instead of using these pinouts, what you do is you use these Grove connectors, which allows you to connect in simply by clicking um, like that. So you, here's a sensor. So here's a temperature sensor right here. You're able to take that sensor, click it in, and then you have your microcontroller here. This microcontroller has both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on it. So what you do is you then flash the software for the sensor onto this microcontroller. And so that means it's able, this computer, this small little computer is able to read the data off of here. Now, this little thing, you can't hook a monitor up and a screen and a keyboard. Up. You can't hook up a keyboard and a screen up to this one because it's not a full operating system like you have with the Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool. This runs um, a, a whole operating system. It's got Windows, the whole works. Whereas this one, it just take, it just does commands. It says, okay, I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna take the data from here and I'm gonna push it through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever. And that's all it does. And it just does that all day, all, all day long. It uses very small amounts of power. Um, and you'll see what we do is we, for each one of the stations, we have the sensor, the sensors inside the component. It comes through, connects to the, um, connects to this, to the, to the microcontroller. Once it connects to the microcontroller, we use a USB, just a regular USB-C cable that you just have like when you, how you charge your iPhones. And that pulls down to a charge control right down to the battery system that we have. And that's how you, and that's basically how it works. And then you have a solar panel to make sure you keep everything charged. And that allows for you to have a very simple and compact piece. So now, as you can see, because you have one microcontroller connected to one element, we call this a node. This node, if I didn't want to collect wind, I don't have to have wind. I can say, okay, well, let me go through instead and look at rain. And rain here, this is, it's got like a little, if you can see here, it's got like a little tipping bucket in here. And then we've got, uh, uh, I'll show you this. We've got a, a little funnel here that you put this over the funnel and basically that connect, connects the funnel and our sensor the same way as it works before comes out as just an, underneath in here that, that measures the tips connects to a micro to connects to the small little microcontroller and anytime it rains you'll just wait for the tip and this here is to make sure that you know birds and such don't nest inside of it that's pretty awesome and it's so cool to see that you can just connect again just the different components as you need them or as you want to print them to build out your weather station and we did have a question about uh, PVC guidance. Dan, would you be able to share the screen so that we can read what is the question that was asked in terms of, is there guidance in what type of PVC works well to build the stand? Does it benefit from using stronger schedule 80 versus schedule 40 pipe? And I'm not too sure about what these, um, these mean, but um, Agbelli, do you have kind of a, information about that? Yeah, we, we generally use, I mean, we generally use one inch PVC pipe, just a regular PVC pipe you can get at, uh, at Walmart or, or Home Depot um, to, to sort of make the stand. Now, others have decided to make the stand out of wood. They've also been uh, other options where you can make the stand out of, out of metal. Um, so it's, it, you really have a lot of flexibility about the stand. The whole purpose that we're looking at here is we want it to be as low cost as possible and basically using, if you want, you could pretty much use scrap that you have to, to build your 3D printed station. This, since this is not a you know, National Weather Service government you, you know, 3D uh, weather station, you're not depending on it for tornado warnings, uh, you can basically use anything, um, any type of station, any type of uh, PVC you'd like. And do you have an estimate of what the cost might be? I know that there's um, maker spaces that you know are at the libraries with 3D printers that you might 
be able to utilize. But in general, if you wanted to build a weather station, um, like a 3D printed weather station, do you have an average cost estimate that might, um, so that we, we get an idea? Yes, you can build a, and we'll have a share a link on our site. We have uh, all of the parts, including the, um, the PVC pipes, including all of the, you know, 3D printed components, whether you want to do it by yourself or outsource it, we have all of those uh, things online, but the cost is under $300 for all of the different components. Now, if I didn't want, say, the rain bucket, because I live in New Mexico, <laughs> or I live in Arizona, and I'm not as interested in the rain bucket, this has, it's, it's, it's pretty heavy, so it takes up a lot of, a lot of um, plastic, so you might want to, like, not use that piece, and we, so what we did was we priced it out bit by each and every, each and every element, so you're able to piece it together all dependent on your budget. So if you only had a $60 budget, you can print a radiation shield, get a battery, get a little solar panel or plug it into the wall and use a Wi-Fi, and you'll be able to have, a, if it's close enough to your house, you'll be able to still have a weather station without having to purchase, you know, a, a, a little, you know, a, a 4G a, a modem for it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And you know, you mentioned the Raspberry Pi and being able to run a weather model or, you know, to be able to put it directly. And I know that NCAR has something called supercomputers, which one of them is Cheyenne. It's a large supercomputer. But you guys have been creative and you've called one Pi-Yan, which is a supercomputer of multiple Raspberry Pis, and I think you have it on your desk. <laughs> exactly, I do have a, if you can see that, I do have a, a scaled model of the uh, Pi-N, uh, of, of the Cheyenne supercomputer. So one of the things that the group here at Sizzle does, they have a different office in Wyoming, which they, uh, where they actually run um, supercomputer forecast. And one of the models they use is called the weather research and forecast model, which was developed here at NCAR and, uh, and through the universities at UCAR. And that model takes all these, it takes a bunch of processors stacked, thousands of processors stacked together and it runs it all in parallel. So it takes all of that data and it's what you call parallel computing. And it take, and if these supercomputers cost, you know, $35 million, they're huge supercomputers. They have huge buildings with air conditions and everything else. So we thought it would be fun to figure out if I, instead of just having one Raspberry Pi, why couldn't we just try to like string them together? So this was sort of like the, the test example when we were sort of um, trialing it. You can see there's just a stack of these Raspberry Pis. You network them together with ethernet cables, sort of like little high-speed ethernet cables. And then you take the same model that you were running on the supercomputers and you try to run it on the Raspberry Pi, and that's what we, uh, that's essentially what we've done. And you can see here, you can actually generate a uh, forecast. And what I'll do is I'll share uh, my screen here real quick and show, um, and show what the, um, what, uh, let's go here and show exactly how, how we do this. And what you'll see is that, uh, let's go to the next one. So that's what the, the Raspberry Pi is. Um, and what you'll see, is what we do is we run the operational forecast on the Pi's just to test it out. And what you have is just a sort of a four-step process. You, you basically, you start, when you start the program, you select how long you want to run a forecast for, what's the start date, what's the end date. Then what you do is you then select sort of the area. And because these are tiny little Pi's, we try not to select, we can't, it's hard to select a whole entire country or you'll have to wait till next year to get a forecast, it'll take too long. But what we do is we select an area about the size of the state. So if, if I wanted to figure out, you know, if it's gonna snow in Colorado, you know, this weekend for skiing, I could kind of draw a little box over Colorado. And then what it does is it, the third step is it, it pulls all the observational data from, you know, from the, from the, from the, the NOAA from the you know, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, it pulls all that data, the satellite data, the observational data, it pulls those, what you call initial conditions, it pulls all of that down, and then it begins to run the actual model on a 
on a on the on the pie, and then it produces a forecast uh, result. And this is something what we've done uh, for fun is you know we of course we have it here on on the uh, Pyan where you, as you can see here and I don't know if I can maybe pull this in a little bit closer as you can see here we have an example of the of the forecast model here that you can see if you can see we have high temperatures or we have low temperatures you can look on you can see that we also forecast what the high temperatures are for the day um, or for the next day um, here but you can also download this onto your Mac PC or or your own Raspberry Pi, even if you just have one Raspberry Pi and you can run it and play with it yourself. Um, and that's another fun thing. And this is part of what we're, what we're thinking about is because you know, we talked about this idea of, of, uh, of IoT. One of the things and one of the trends in IoT is that you have things like this that are instrumented, they have computing, power and storage connected to it. Now, as you start expanding these networks, you should be able to have what you call edge computing. That means these, uh, these IoT devices can become smarter and smarter where the IoT devices eventually can start doing you know, artificial intelligence. They can start creating their own models and start doing other cool things on the edge. You can actually have sort of distributed or IPFS or distributed storage and distributed computing so that it doesn't necessarily have to all be located on one place. So the more stations you have, the more they can begin to start to work together. And of course, I'm starting to dream here, <laughs> but these are the types of things that we would like to, it's under development and the types of things that we'd like to work with the community to sort of build on and to kind of create these sort of cool connected uh, networks of, of, of weather stations and of these types of you know, computing and smart devices that can actually come up with forecasts and cool things to, to, for people to, 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 to make decisions off of. That's awesome. And um, if I can ask if you can stop sharing your screen, we have a question about Raspberry Pi um, and Arduino, which I'm not too familiar with, but I'm wondering if you can help us um, with what they're asking about. And okay. I mean, uh, so the question is, coming up on the screen and it says, are these stations with Raspberry Pi better than the ones built with Arduino? And how accurate are the values compared with traditional weather stations? And that's a very good question. So, so our first, I'll answer the second question when it comes to how accurate they are. They're reasonably accurate and we, we're not, they're not meant to be at least, to, at least these little IOT stations. These smaller stations are not going to be quite as accurate as obviously the twenty thousand dollar, you know, stations of record. Those stations are made by companies like Vaisala and you know and Young and some of these companies. Uh, they're really they've been building these things for years and years. They're but they're super super accurate to like the point you know something degree, 0.1 degree accuracy or less. So they're super accurate and they stay calibrated and they, do, they go through a lot of efforts in terms of calibrations and analysis of these things. That being said, if the, these microcontrol or these sensors here have become more and more accurate. And the thing about this, this sensor costs $4. And you know, maybe 10 years ago they didn't, 15 years ago they didn't have sensors this small with that amount of cost. So the, it's sort of a trade-off if you're trying to under. So one of the things that we're looking at in this trade-off is that if you look at the distribution of weather stations all over the globe, there's a lot of places that don't have weather stations. A lot of communities across Africa, across the developing world, across areas and communities, especially. Uh, underrepresented communities and communities from uh, minority communities where they do not have the networks of, of weather stations, being able to understand how weather impacts your local community and the development of your local community is an important thing. And I think cost and price shouldn't get, of course, shouldn't get in the way of that. And now the technology and IoT is getting to the point where, yes, I can use a small sensor like this and uh, a small microcontroller and, and determine the sensor or uh, determine the, the, the environment. Now to your first question, the difference between Arduino and a uh, Raspberry Pi is Arduino, and I'm, let me try to figure out, like, I'm gonna try to explain this. Uh, this has a full on operating system and will generally use uh, 
Python or, or a, a, a type of programming language where you actually program in the different coding to, um, to, to make it read the data off the sensors and, 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 and run things. Now, different people, and I don't want to get into the fight about that, different people, <laughs> it's like green chili versus red chili. I mean, if you go to New Mexico, that's a, that's a tough argument to, to have a jollof rice, you know, Ghanaian jollof rice versus Nigerian jollof rice. You just don't have those arguments, but, <laughs> but the, it's a matter of preference. But if you look at this, this will run on, on Python and um, Python, or, uh, Python is, is an absolutely awesome language. It, it allows you to do a lot of things things uh, with the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi does take up quite a bit of power. That would be one downside is that it takes a lot of power to run all of that versus the amount of electricity it takes to run this tiny little thing. So this tiny little thing actually runs on Arduino. Now Arduino is for microcontrollers, it's not a full-on operating system and it only runs what you tell it to run, which is basically a very clean and tight and small bit of code that you put on here and it can only send out bytes very small amounts of bytes at a time and receive small amounts of bytes at a time whereas this acts like an actual full-on computer so personally I, what we've been looking at if you want to look at it from the perspective of iot uh having less smaller tinier things interconnected like this so that if this thing breaks, I pull off the microcontroller, I replace the microcontroller, I replace the sensor, and off I go. I think, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at here. It's easier, at least easier for students. And also one of the things we wanted to do, of course, is, you know, a lot of feedback from schools is the soldering issue that they don't want to necessarily put soldering irons in the hands of, of you know, different uh, uh, junior high and high school kids um, with soldering. I can't really solder that well. I'm not an engineer, so I look at soldering and go, Ugh. Um, but it, but if, if I was advanced, I, you'd be able to solder and be able to deal with these. So those are sort of the differences. It's kind of a matter of preference. Sometimes I think with this, you can do more advanced programming because you have the whole Python aspect to it. So you do have some advantages. For example, I could run a small little um, machine learning uh, application on here. Now, the last point I will point out is that you can have, because the station is modular, that means you have your wind, you have your rain, you have your temperature. You can also have a Raspberry Pi inside of the box that stores data, that plots data, that it becomes a, a little node or some kind of server for you and do, and you can take advantage of both worlds. So you can have the best of both worlds if you have a modular sort of IoT styled system. And that's sort of what our goal here is to make it completely up to the user to decide what and how they want to do things. That's awesome. And um, we do have another question and it was also kind of, I love that there are people responding to each other on this um, Slido. And first I wanted, um, before before Dan puts the next question up, is just um, a general, there was a question about if a webcam could be added to the system. And there was a response that said that you can incorporate um, a Raspberry Pi because they have a webcam hat that you could plug in. Yes, you have, a, you have what's called a pie hat. So that's a, a way to um, uh, put a little hat on top of a Raspberry Pi. And they actually have a, a pie hat that allows you to have, you see these connectors here that you're allowed to connect things in. You have a Grove hat also so that you can use these sensors on, instead of having to connect to these pins, you can actually have an adapter basically to allow you to connect sensors do it that way so you can connect a, a system that way you have another here's an example of a camera that i've been playing with just a little gopro that you can actually use to um, take pictures and through your raspberry pi download and upload those pictures into the sort of data repository and that's one of the things that we've been working with um uh mike daniels over at uh uh, I guess now he's at the uh, Colorado State University on basically taking it and visualizing the data. And we've been visualizing the data on a uh, core on a system called Chords. We're also looking at other sort of IoT and one of our summer students from uh, Gita from last summer at the SciParks program, she's actually developed other methods and tools to have
have a, a very good, cool dashboards and visualization to basically be able to take all this data and make sense of the data and make nice pictures and charts and, and recognize trends from the data. It's so great to hear the contribution of scientists at an early career stage on these projects. So thank you for sharing all those as well. Um, and Dan, can we put up a question about a time reference that was being asked about um, these weather stations? And the question says, where did the stations get a time reference? Do the internal clocks drift significantly? Can you get time from either data connection type, Wi-Fi or cell modem? Yes. So what what we've what we've done just to be um, simpletons about it, <laughs> we've basically take the time from the from our Wi-Fi uh, connection. And so essentially, we have a Wi-Fi connection, and every computer has sort of like a uh, internal clock on it, or system control system D clock on uh, on the device, and we basically pull that time from that, and we just when we just go with that and try not to get too fancy with our timing. That's awesome. Simple is sometimes better because then you <laughs> decrease the, um, the cause for errors <laughs> or replacement needs. Um, and we do have another question about the Raspberry Pi cluster. Um, Dan, if you can put that up on the screen, please. And it asks, how large is your Pi cluster now? And are you using the Raspberry Pi 4B, 64-bit, and with 8 gigabytes or on, of onboard RAM? Yes, that's a very good question. So we have 14 Pis connected here. If you look here, we have 14, uh, we have 14 Pis um, connected here. We have sort of the a master node of our excuse me, uh, 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 we have the node one, basically like the control node for the Raspberry Pi, uh, for the Pi. And then we have uh, all of the different nodes that connect. So this, the first node controls all of the other nodes. So you submit the job here. So we have, we have 56 cores total. We have about 14 uh, gigabytes uh, RAM uh, storage, a little over 500 gigabytes of storage when you add it all, um, when you add it all together. Um, these are all, each one of these are Raspberry Pi 3Bs. Um, uh, I will like to mention that with the in-car is coming up, uh, Sizzle, we're getting a new um, supercomputer. We're still, they're still got a competition where it's going to name the supercomputer. And I believe it's a Cray, it's a Cray supercomputer. So we'll, it'll look different, it's going to have a different name, and we might try to do an example where maybe we would use, instead of Raspberry Pis, there's maybe there's Jetson Nanos, and instead of using um, these types of, of, of CPUs, we might, you know, try to do something with GPUs and see how cool we can, you know, try to develop other things um, using, um, you know, just showing how um, the, the supercomputers work at NCAR, and this is just a really cool um, example. That's so great. And I'm so glad that we're getting so many questions that we can have this conversation about all the cool research that's taking place and all the new technologies that NCAR is providing. And of course, it also provides to the university communities as a resource for being able to run different models on these supercomputers. And I wanted to ask, um, Agbeli, is there another slide that you have with links to how people uh, can yes. access all of this information on Raspberry Pis, WARF, and um, the 3D printed weather stations. Yes, I'll share that. And so these resources, um, this, this is for the, um, for, for the uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, if you would like to try running these your, yourself, you can actually, there's a GitHub page um, here, and I think we also included the links in the, um, in the invitation or the event, right? And on the GitHub, you can, you can basically do, you can download the software and run it on your Raspberry Pi, or you can run it on your Mac or PC. Uh, I would also like to mention that if you wanted to go into the GitHub page and unpack it and look at the actual source code and, you know, 
and you know basically open the hood and, and play with it that way as well. Um, we have all of the software and all of the inf all of the information there is completely open source, free to use and free to play with. Um, and if you have any questions or any trouble with it, just send us a note or, or or I think on the GitHub page, which is that link there, you can actually does that. There's a thing where you can actually hit issues and you can say, hey, this isn't working. Or sometimes you can just email email us and we can send you other things to clarify things. Yeah, and I know the link is very small for us to see, so we'll make sure to keep it. We'll add it to um, add this PDF of the instructions on how to build the 3D weather station as well as the wharf model. Yeah, and I'll onto show the email that we send out through Eventbrite um, along with the survey for this event. But go ahead. Yes, and I'll show the uh, the uh, the weather station. We also have a GitHub page for that. And you can see here, this is still under the, under development, and we're actually having you know st the students in Puerto Rico, and when we send it to schools, we're actually still getting feedback, um, and they've been testing the stations and testing the sort of instructions, and we've basically created a a, a, a thing a, a a manual which basically has images and pictures, but it kind of shows you starting from planning. It has a complete parts list, a list of parts. It has, you know, with the links so that you can sort of see if I wanted to order the different parts, you can see everything listed in a spreadsheet with all the prices and uh, for, for all the different components. It shows you how to build. It has sort of like an Ikea looking manual with that, uh, that one of our collaborators helped us uh, develop uh, with Alex helped us with. And it's, it's got some cool sort of uh, CAD, you know, like nice Ikea looking drawings to show you how it comes together. We have instructions on how do you install the software or flash the software onto this little microcontroller. Um, that's we're still working on that section. Then the next bit is testing the, the, the station. Sometimes it's good if, if you're at home, but if you want to put it outside of your home, it's good to sort of test the station, see how well the station works um, before you go out, This, which is what they're doing in Puerto Rico. They're going to actually put it on the roof of the physics building at the University of Puerto Rico. So before they go up there, they're, they're testing it and doing all that stuff now. Um, and then the last step, of course, is deploy. Um, and then um, at any point, there's on the GitHub page, um, there's this new issues button um, where you can actually contribute. And for example, if you said, hey, I wanted to look at soil moisture because it rains here a lot and we've got a garden and we're trying to understand uh, you know, soil moisture issues as well, you can actually add a soil moisture sensor um, to this node using the same you know, uh, microcontrollers, uh, you know, using uh, Grove wires, uh, growth connectors and growth and seed studio sensors and you know and just test things like a uv light sensor a camera or anything like that and if you do do something cool like that or or even have some changes you can actually push or contribute your changes back and tell all the rest of the community that hey we've done those changes and we will take those changes from from you from you as a part of the community and it goes into advancing the, the, the weather station in general for everyone to, 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 to learn from and to use. That's so great, because I think that answers a few questions. I know that there's um, people that are asking, you know, specific questions to their um, weather station. And I think you allow also for questions from the community. If you're having issues with it, you can send in your questions and they'll get answered. And then, um, you know, but with the wharf modeling, do you have to be an expert or is it okay to be a beginner? Um, in programming in order to be able to access this or to, to start playing with this? So there's, uh, and that's a very good question because what we've done is we've packaged the, um, the, the WARF model, we've, we've packaged it up into what's called a Docker container. Um, and a Docker container is essentially like a, um, like when you used to have this is going to age me a bit. Like you used to have CDs <laughs> that you download and you get Microsoft or, or or something like that on your 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 CD and you install it onto your computer and then you have you know you have the program. So what we've done is we've packaged all of the code and everything into something that runs into a little container and then you the commands that that are in the instructions are basically telling it, hey, pull the pull the you know the CD or the the, the code start the container onto your onto your computer or onto your Raspberry Pi, run it, and then it interfaces through the container. It interfaces with your screen, 
uh, through you know X11 or X quartz if you're a Mac user or one of those um, systems and it shows the results of the model on to your screen or in this case we're using VNC viewer which basically allows it to like take the data and and view the data onto your onto your onto your screen so that's if you're a, a sort of a beginner um, or don't want to deal with the the, the, code, the code is nice. I do that. I just pull up now that I've done it on Docker. It's nice. I can just run it and see. Oh, let's see how the snow looks coming up this weekend. Um, that's fun. But then, if you want to go to the advanced level, we have the entire source code completely and the developer's guide completely open. So you can do, you can download the raw source code for the weather forecast models. You can actually you know from scratch build and compile your own um, wharf model and your own systems and basically recreate a, a different one with different settings if you wanted to because um, there's a, a bunch of different knobs that you can turn and you can set that as well that's so great thank you so much like valerie for talking with us and i know there's so much more to go into for raspberry pi we could talk for hours about this um but i did want to just give a little bit of time i know we're running up and to the hour now. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you know, you do so much science, but is there anything that you do kind of to do a work-life balance or, you know, some advice that you can also give um, to people that are interested in, in kind of pursuing this type of career? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of this is really all about experimenting, playing, and just lifelong uh, learning. And the uh, idea here is this is for you know, citizen scientists, you don't necessarily have to be a scientist per se, or, you know, a scientist, you, the, this is open there. These microcontrollers are made for anyone to be able to play with from all ages. Um, and that's the thing that I think is really exciting about that. Um, and also I like these things because I spend a lot of time outdoors and, you know, I like to be able to understand these types of things because I like to, to prepare, I'm trying to do expeditions and I'd like to train for expeditions and go camping. And I work with the ski patrol, or at least volunteer ski patrol. So I like to do things that are outdoors and actually work with those types of things. So that's, I think your passion for other things can also drive your passion for science. So if you really like, you know, sailing or outdoors or hiking or whatever your uh, passion is, you can also look at what are some of the science related issues related to those things. And I think that also motivates you to, um, to discover more. And what do you do? Um, do you have a picture of anything that you oh, do yeah. outside? Because well, you got do some a lot pictures. of adventures as well. Yeah, so we've got uh, so some of the adventures. This was just last uh, the last year. We, I was in. I did some ocean racing uh, with the Maiden Factor, which was an absolutely wonderful experience. And that was with um, it was the first uh, female all round the world uh, sailing team. Uh, is what the, what they were. They were actually in the. Uh, the, the maiden factor competed in the Volvo Ocean Race. It was wonderful to sail and compete on the um, in the Caribbean 600 and the Heineken Regatta last year. So I really enjoyed um, that experience. It's a wonderful experience. Um, of course, weather is. I mean, you move all based on what the weather is doing and what the wind is doing. So you know, of course, that's super fun. Um, and is it? Um, this is like pre-COVID. This was pre COVID, of course. <laughs> everything got everything got canceled this year, of course. But um, this was right last, like almost a year ago, exactly. So about this time last year, February, March, I was um, uh, in the, the was was there um, doing that. And the Volvo Ocean Racing one was actually before that. It was a couple of years before that one when I was in Alicante. Um, and then, of course, I do enjoy. Um, skiing and i you know I've, I've been just learning and doing um you know cross country um sort of like expedition sort of skiing where you go you have a sled and you ski around and you can it's like hiking but hiking in for the winter time and in this in this example we've got the weather station in tow up at the uh, uh mountain research station at niwat ridge which is a very high it's above tree line and they have multiple sort of climate zones that you can look at 
and compare our weather station to some of the more ex, you know, expensive and professional weather stations, you can sort of compare those two things and see what that environment's like. It's a super harsh environment. This is a nice day there, but when it's windy and everything else, it's, <laughs> it's a tough environment, but it's fun to, um, to, um, to go there and to camp there. And I also work with um, the Bryan Mountain um, volunteer ski patrol, which is, uh, you know, where you do trainings. And these are all learnings, like, you know, I just took an avalanche uh, course, and you're learning about, you're learning CPR, you're learning all about from people who are just wonderful group of people, you're just learning about things outdoors and the, and the weather and how the snowpack is and all of these other things. It's just absolutely super duper fun. That's so great, because somebody actually had asked if you had any experience with survivability in extreme events, because where they are located, it was negative 40 degrees Celsius last week. Um, and yes. actually, the question is, would the stations be operable in that type of weather? Well, right now, I would say not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, so the, the the stations and as you can see this example it gets that cold if you know up there at the Niwat Ridge and it gets very very windy um, at that location but where we have issues of course is going to be your power it's going to be an issue or your um, in your communications if those two things are going to stay on now Scott Landolt another scientist at um, Incar uh, put weather stations down in Antarctica, which would be absolutely cool. I would absolutely love for these types of stations to go down there. But he was, when I was chatting with him, I believe they use something like 18 or 20 batteries, huge batteries that they buried and, and use it because it's cold or it's dark six months out of the year. So you would have to actually be able to keep the station running for the whole entire time. And then you'd also have to worry about icing. You have to, so the, so the wind turbines, if that thing that I stopped and just clam up because it's too icy. So there's a lot of things to um, consider, but for now we're just kind of saying, let's see if we can, you know, we got Puerto Rico, we've got this, we've got some desert. We're trying to start to build the thing and just sort of testing it right now. That's so awesome. And um, one last question real quick, you know, if there are schools that are interested in contributing to these projects, um, is it possible to, to get schools involved? Uh, yes, it's possible for, to get schools involved and it's good to have schools just you know, try to put it together and, and, you know, and if they have a 3D printer or if they don't have a 3D printer, we could, we could work with them and figure out how to, you know, put a piece together. We could start with one section, like one element and then expand from there. So you don't have to build it all at once. You can just build one piece that you're most interested in and then sort of build on it from there. So we're happy to work with uh, different schools. We're still developing curriculum items and, and things about four schools we haven't done that yet but it's but I, I finished it yet but I think it's one of the types of things that we can't do it in a vacuum it's, it's you know with like I'm not a teacher but it's good to work with teachers and with students to get their feedback so it's not so it comes from the community um, and not just from us that's so awesome and with that if you can stop sharing your screen um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. This presentation will be available on our NCAR Explorer series website. And if you are interested in what happened in Antarctica with um, NCAR scientist Scott Landel, we do have that recording as well in one of our years. I think it was the 2019 year as well, um, or 2018. But you can check them out. <laughs> They're all really awesome. Um, thank you, Egg Valley, for answering mostly all of the questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, um, but we'd love to get your feedback, uh, especially since this is our first event of the year. And we've been doing conversations where we can interact more with the audience in this virtual world through Slido. And also we'll be doing um, still our traditional lectures and more conversations with more people, with panelists and things like that. So keep an eye out. Um, I wanna thank the whole team for joining us and thank you everybody for sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. Agbelli, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. We'll see you soon. Bye.